All right, this video is over sampling distributions, specifically for proportions. All right, so let's do a quick recap. I don't want to um, talk too much about what we've already covered, but we've already covered about what sampling distributions are. Remember, a sampling distribution is simply a picture of what every possible sample of size n would look like if it was drawn from the same population. Now, we talked an awful lot about what these sampling distributions look like. Now, we're actually going to specifically talk about one that is for proportions. Okay, so... Here we go. Our first problem is going to be a very, very simple one. Okay? I'm going to tell you guys that 70% of Americans wear their seatbelt. Okay? Now, a couple things I want to talk about real quick is, first off, sample size matters. So let's say that I'm going to take a sample of 85 people, and I want to see how many of those 85 people are going to wear their seatbelt. I'm sorry, what proportion of them? Well, again, we expect 70%, right? So when we think about how many, right? So there's two ways of thinking about this. How many um, versus what proportion? Okay, now we want to focus on the proportion part, but th understanding how many is also pretty important. So we actually already know a lot about the how many, because we know that if you have 85 people, you certainly expect 70% of them to be wearing their seatbelt. So 85 times 0.7 is 59.5. So we expect 59.5 of them to be wearing their seatbelt. Well, of course, that number could deviate. So there's a standard deviation. The standard deviation that we know is it would be 85 times uh, P, 70, times times Q, 30%, and let's see what we get for that, 85 times 0.7 times 0.3, we get 4.22. Okay, easy, 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 everybody knows those formulas. However, we're focusing on the proportion, so I want to know what proportion do you expect? Well, first, understand how do you find a proportion. How do you find a proportion? You divide by your sample size. So if I take how many and I divide by my sample size of 85, hey, what do you know? The 85's cancel. So what proportion do I expect for every one of my samples? Well, that would be 70%, all right? Notice this notation. This notation is really, really important. Mu is the mean, the average, the middle, what we expect. The p hat is the fact that you know, this right here is the true P. We always have a true value of 70%. But every individual sample, that's P hat, the individual samples, we expect every one of those individual samples to also reflect 70%. But of course, some may not, some may be a little bit higher, some may be a little bit lower, and that's why we also have a standard deviation for our sampling distribution as well. Well, this is the standard deviation for one, right? This is the standard deviation, excuse me, for how many. So again, how do you find a proportion? You divide by your sample size. So all you got to do is divide that by 85, and you get your answer. But I want to show you a little bit easier formula for this real quick. Here was the formula we used. This is the general formula for how many. This is the standard deviation for how many. Well, I'm going to need to divide that by n to find the proportion of how many, right? Divide by n. That's how you find a proportion. Divide by your total. So I just want to quickly show you what happens here. First off, I'm going to break the top apart. I'm going to put the pq in their own square root. And you'll see why in a second. This is completely allowed by our rules of algebra. This is n to the 1 half times the square root of pq divided by n. Now, since I have common denom or common basis here, n and n, what I can do is I can subtract the exponents. So 1 half minus the 1 is negative 1 half. A negative exponent doesn't cause you any issues. A negative exponent simply moves you to the bottom. So this is going to be the square root of pq divided by n to the 1 half, right? So that negative 1 half moves to the bottom as a positive 1 half. Well, a 1 half is the same as a square root. So we get the square root of pq divided by the square root of n. And that's the same thing as a giant square root root around PQ divided by M. Now, if you don't understand that, that was just the algebra proving to you that to find the standard deviation for the proportion, all you're taking is your standard deviation for how many dividing it by n. I'm just saying that this formula right here tends to be a little bit cleaner looking. So when I come back over here to actually talk about my problem, my formula for the standard deviation of the proportion would be 0.7 times 0.3 divided by 85. Now, what I'm trying to get you to believe is that the result of this is the same thing as just by taking this and dividing it by 85. But my way is just a little bit of a faster, cleaner way of getting there. <coughs> Excuse me. And I get a uh, 0 0.04. Uh, 9, 7, okay? So that, again, is the standard deviation for the proportion. Now, 
all of this, I'm hoping, is going to start to make sense here in one second. So I have a couple of questions here that I want to talk about so we could truly understand what's going on here. 70% of people wear their seatbelt. I'm going to look at a sample of 85. So I'm going to get a P hat. That's my sample proportion. If I collect a random sample, it should look like the 70%, but it may not. It may go up and down. So first off, I want to model this situation. I want to make a model that says, what could happen when you interview 85 people and ask them, hey, what proportion of you wear your seatbelt? Well, first off, what does, the model, what does the model look like? Well, we know that it looks like the normal model. Well, how can we be sure? Because there are three conditions that allow the normal model to be used. I'm going to go through those three conditions. They're probably going to sound pretty, pretty familiar. The first one is that the sample must be random. Your sample of 85 people must be random without bias. The second condition is that your sample size n must be less than 10% of the population. We talked about this in class. We don't want to take away too many because then we have samples that start to overlap and independence is all of a sudden violated. The third condition is that we must be big enough. We learned that big enough means that you must have 10 successes and 10 failures. So if I'm going to do this, if I have 85% um, times, or 80, sorry, not 85%, 85 people times 0.7, that means I expect 59.5 successes. And if I take 85 and times it by 0.3, or the 30% failure, I get 25.5. So I do have more than 10 successes and more than 10 failures. That is what we call the big enough condition. So as long as those three things are met, we could be sure that the model will turn out to be normal. I'm actually going to make a slight picture of it real quick here. Again, we all know what the normal model looks like. Now, what's the center? Well, the center is mu, right? This is what we expect all of our sample proportions to be. Notice my notation. It's really important. Mu with the little tiny p hat and the subscript there. What do we expect all of the samples to be? Well, we expect them all to be 70%. Why not, right? So we expect the middle here to be 70%. But again, that value might deviate. Well, there's a standard deviation for that as well. And we already know that standard deviation. We calculated it up here. Hopefully everybody stands my formula. Square root of PQ divided by N all inside the square root. Hopefully you understand where that came from by what I showed earlier. And the formula, or the answer to that was 0 0.0497. Now, just for sake of pictures, is you guys okay if I round this to 0.05 or about 5%? This means that I could have a sample go to 75%, and that would be totally cool. I could have a sample go down to 65%, and that'd be totally normal. I could have a sample go up to 80%, that'd be pretty normal, not a big deal. I could have a sample that drops as low as 60%. But it would be very weird if I had a sample go as high as 85%, or a sample go as low as 65%. Why? Because that's more than two standard deviations away. We know that from negative two standard deviations to positive two standard deviations is where's the majority of our data data falls. That is what is, well, normal. So most samples are going to fall within that range. If I did get a sample that was above 80% or a sample that was below 60%, I'd be pretty shocked. That would be very, very strange, a little bit interesting. I bet that that sample was probably biased. And again, this is the idea of a sampling distribution for a proportion. These are the three questions you have, or four questions you have to ask yourself. What model is it? It's normal. Why can I know? How do I know it's a normal model? We talked about those three conditions. What's the center? Make sure you're using my notation. What's the standard deviation or the spread? Make sure you're using my notation. And it's all very, very easy. So let me just kind of come over here and summarize this real quick. The center of a sampling distribution for a proportion is the truth. We always expect the truth to occur. But we understand that it might go a little bit higher, a little bit lower, and that's why there's a standard deviation for the sampling distribution as well. It is the formula of the square root of n, I'm sorry, I already messed that up, the square root of pq divided by n, pq divided by n. Hopefully you understand my algebra over here in terms of where that formula came from, but it is the correct formula whether you believe me or not. So again, those are the two formulas that create the center and the spread of your sampling distribution over here. Pretty easy, pretty simple to understand, I hope. Okay, we're going to look at another problem here. We're actually going to use our model to answer a question, a probability question. A polling organization asks a simple random sample of 1,500 first-year college students how far away their home is. Suppose that 35% of all first-year college students attend college within 50 miles of home. 
Find the probability that a sample of 1,500 students will give a result within two percentage points of this true value. Well, to understand this, the first thing I have to do is I have to make a model. Right? Any of these problems, the first step is to make a model. Guess what model I'm going to make? Of course, the normal model. Second step is making sure that your three conditions are met so that you know we can use the normal model. It did say we conducted a simple random sample. Number two is that we must assume that 1,500 is less than 10% of all first-year college students. And I don't know how many first-year college students there are, but I know there's a lot of them throughout the United States, so it's probably true. And number three is we do need to show that there are more than 10 successes and more than 10 failures. And this is probably definitely going to be true, but I'm going to check it real quick. 35% of these students are expected to um, be, uh, you know, within five, 50 miles of homes. That's 525. And then obviously that would be 65% um, failure. So if I take 1500 and multiply it by 0.65, I get that we have 975 kids that are not within five, or not within 50 miles of home. So both of those numbers are bigger than 10, well bigger than 10. So this is how I know the normal model can work. Third step is figuring out what my center is. Well, what do I expect any sample to look like? Well, why would I expect anything other than what's true? So I certainly expect 35% or 0.35 of a sample to be within 50 miles of home. But that number might deviate. So there is a standard deviation attached to this. So that's going to be the square root of 0.35p times 0.65, that's q, all divided by 1,500. Sorry for my sloppy handwriting here. I'm trying to write pretty small there. So it's the square root of 0.35 times 0.65 divided by 1500 and I get 0 0.0123 so I'm going to go ahead and actually make a picture of this model now oh, that's a pretty ugly line I'm going to make a picture of this model because making a picture of the model is really the easiest way to show your work trust your work and understand the problem so once again it's right smack dab in the middle is the 35 percent of students that I expect to live within 50 miles of home and I can go up one, I can go up two, I can go up three standard deviations, down one, down two, down three. Um, for sake of the picture, well, I, I actually probably shouldn't round this, but you get the idea that this is going to go up to 0.35 plus one standard deviation, which is 0 0.0123, and I get 0 0.3623. And I'm going to go down one standard deviation, so 0.35 down 0 0.0123, and I get 0.3377. Okay, and you get the idea, right? Okay, now the question says, find the probability that a sample of 1,500 will give a result within two percentage points of this true value. Now, within two percent can mean several things, right? Within two percent actually means plus or minus. So get used to that within word, meaning plus or minus. So if I'm within two percentage points, that means I can go as low as 33 percent. So as low as 33 percent, or as high as 37 percent. As long as I am between 33 and 37 percent, I am within two percentage points of the truth. Remember, here's the truth in the middle, 35 percent. So as long as I am going down two percent to the left, up two percent to the right, I'm within two percent. So to find that probability, to find the probability that I'm within that two percent range, all I got to do is find the z-scores for 33 and 37 percent. Now, because of symmetry, they should be the same z-scores, but just on opposite sides. So what's the z-score? Well, huh, I'm trying to find the z-score for 33%, 0 0.33, minus, I expect 35%, 0 0.35, divided by the standard deviation, 0 0.0123. So 0 0.33 minus 0 0.35 divided by 0 0.0123 is a standard deviation of negative 1.62. And I'm also going to find the z-score for 37%, which is two standard or two percentages above. So 0.37 minus what I expect, 35%, divided by my standard deviation. Again, this z-score formula should be all stuff you guys are used to. 0.37 minus 0.35 is positive 0.02, divided by 0.0123, and I get positive 1.62. Actually, I apologize. That should be 1.63 if we round correctly. And this would be positive 1.63. So now I want to find the proportion of data that's in between there. I want to find the probability that my proportion, my sample p hat, is between 0.33 and 
three, seven. Okay? Now again, it's all about notation. Notice how I'm showing my work. I'm trying to find the proportion or the probability that a sample p hat comes in within two percent. Right? Within two percent is thirty three to thirty seven percent. Point three three point three seven. Now how am I going to get this answer? I'm going to use normal CDF on my calculator. But guys, please, showing normal CDF as your work is not the only way you're going to get credit. In fact, you're not going to get a whole lot of credit at all. You do got to show all your work. So again, I'm going to use a normal CDF, and I'm going to go from negative 1.63 to positive 1.63, and I get a probability, a proportion of 0 0.8969, 0 0.8969. So there's almost a 90% chance that a sample is going to come within two percentage points of the true value pretty easy. I really hope that this video makes sense. You just have to understand that I want you to follow a, a specific set of rules. What model are you going to use? Tell me the normal model. How do you know? Show me those three conditions. What's your data looking like? Well, it's going to look like 35%, but it's going to deviate by that standard deviation. With those three things, once you understand the model, you could draw a picture of it, and any question that I could ask you should be simple to find using z-scores and whatnot. But it's all about being able to set up your data. So hopefully this problem, hopefully the idea of sampling distributions for proportions makes sense. Pretty easy. We'll talk a lot more about it in class.